Hello and welcome to the AFA Member Update webinar. My name is Michael Novak and I am the AFA National President and I want to thank you for joining us today. Ideally, we would have loved to do this as a roadshow event nationally face-to-face. -face. However, just due to the COVID environment, we've uh, decided to go with a webinar series and uh, web webinar today to uh, update our members based on uh, AFA strategy or, or priorities for 2021 and also policy issues that will update you. I know this has been heavily uh, promoted as a policy update. So I'll go through my session and give, make sure that there's plenty of time uh, for the Phil Anderson session regarding the policy update, because I know that these issues are important to you and also plenty of time for questions later on. Uh, Phil Kewen is unable to join us today. So this session will be run by myself as president and Phil Anderson. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, all attendees will be on mute during the webinar. Uh, we've also allowed some time uh, after each section questions and also questions at the end. Um, if you do want to ask a question, please use the Zoom QA function. You can just see that below on the slide with the, with the green tick to ask your questions and not the, the chat function um, you can see below. Uh, the webinar will be available, uh, recorded and available on demand. Uh, and we will ask you some, we will at times ask you some polling questions. So we really appreciate your insights. Uh, in terms of toilets and all of that, well, you're in your office, so you know where those are. Um, just to go through the, uh, next Phil, please, uh, to go through the agenda for today. Um, as president, I will be looking to, to, to welcome you and give you a bit of insight into myself and the board, uh, some insight into the AFA priorities for this year, um, and also what we believe will be the challenges and opportunities and how the AFA will be looking to respond to those. Um, that'll be followed by a session with, with Phil Anderson in terms of uh, in-depth discussion on current policy issues. And then I'll reconnect after that and, and uh, uh, detail some ways in which uh, you as members can connect with your AFA community uh, and get involved. Uh, next, please, Phil. So a little bit about me. Um, I know a lot of you, so those I do know, please bear with me. Uh, I've been an advisor uh, since 2005 and an, and an AFA member, I think not too long after that. Um, I started this presidency term in October, 2020. Um, uh, but in terms of my own business, being an advisor, I, uh, uh, I own my own business, Novak Financial Services. Uh, I bought that off my father via a successful family uh, business succession. Um, Joe Novak, my father, is, is actually a past AFA president as well, so it runs in the blood. Um, we have our office uh, in West Brisbane, uh, just near the barracks, uh, and we have a view of uh, just near Suncorp Stadium for those Queenslanders uh, that are joining us today, known as the, the Fortress. Uh, I completely and utterly believe in advice. Uh, I love giving advice, primarily risk advice um, and also pre-retirement, retirement planning as well. Um, I think it's, it's, it, it's an honor to be able to help clients to, to understand and achieve their goals. And I think there's no better feelings when you get that result with, with your clients. Um, I've had a heavy involvement with the AFA pretty much since the start of my career. Uh, originally, I was involved in the Gen X movement. I, I led the Queensland Gen X movement uh, when that first started up in Queensland. Uh, I just love being involved in a community of like minded professionals where we're able to, to uh, accelerate each other's careers and share our knowledge and, and pain and, and, and help each other out. Um, I then became the AFA Queensland State Director for two years. And then following that, I was the, um, the AFA National President in 2013 and 14. That was my first run as president. Um, and I, I refer to those years as, as the FOFA years where uh, we were working heavily with Matthias Corman at the time uh, to, 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 uh, to get some policy outcomes, sensible policy outcomes for advisors. Um, last four years, I've been the AFA Vice President serving under, under Mark Bynum. And um, this is my, this, this president term now will be my last term because there's a maximum of 10 that we can have on the uh, AFA, uh, AFA board. Um, so I'll see out my last term uh, as, as president. Uh, I've always had a high focus um, and regard for, for policy and advocacy. Uh, I've always worked uh, and placed a lot of um, uh, time working with politicians, helping them to, to understand the value of advice and to help them make better and more informed decisions. Um, as I mentioned, I, I worked closely with Matthias Corman uh, back in the 2013, 14, for a few years, uh, but also go through how we are working with, with, with government um, in, um, uh, currently. Um, there's some great pictures there, I think, of history. It's good to see uh, one of, of Richard Clifford and, and, uh, and Jim Taggart uh, uh, as well. That's from, from probably 2010. Um, next slide, please, Phil. I wanted to introduce you to the AFA Board of Directors. So all these, bar Sean McDonough, uh, our, our new independent director, 
are, are active advisors. Um, we do have a federated model. So the top row of myself, uh, Sam Pereira as vice president and Matt Hawkins as the executive, but then the, the row below that um, is, is our state directors. We have a federated model. So these, these advisors are representing you uh, and, and your state. So if you do want to get involved, please get in touch with Catherine, Patricia, Stephen, Sam, or Jawad, um, and just see how you can help them or, or, or just see how you can be involved within the AFA. Uh, they're very approachable and, and they're very nice people. I can vouch for that. Uh, next slide, please. Phil. So introducing our first independent director, um, there's a great picture there of, of Sean McDonough uh, outside Parliament House in Canberra. Um, Sean displayed a great combination uh, of skills and experience uh, that we believe would serve the AFA board and its membership. Um, he had extensive board experience, uh, high level governance um, and a skill set um, from extensively working with professional service industries such as education, uh, health and, and disability service. I uh, also had um, some, some experience in his past roles working in advocacy, ad advocacy which we thought was really important. Um, we are delighted to have Sean uh, join the board. So um, great to be working with him. Uh, just going through the AFA vision, uh, look, our, what we want to achieve in the AFA is empowering our financial advice professionals to transform the lives of Australians through quality financial advice. Um, next slide, please. In terms of our mission, how we do this, we aim to create an environment for financial advice professionals to collaborate, uh, advocate, us innovate and learn. The AFA wholeheartedly believes in the value of advice in what you do, and we're here to support you. Uh, next slide. So I, what I wanted to do, I believe it's appropriate that we share, um, and very important that we share the AFA priorities for 2021. Uh, top of the list there is supporting advisors to pass the FASIR exam. Uh, there's nine, 10 months left uh, to, to pass the exam. And at this stage, I believe there's five exams left uh, and only about 50% of advisors have passed. Um, the AFA wants to see as many advisors who choose to stay in advice do the exam, sit the exam and pass it. We believe it's so important that advisors stay in advice if they can. Um, we encourage you to do so. We're here to support you um, if you choose to, but we just, it's forecast to be a shortage uh, of advisors. And it's just so important that the, the, our clients, Australians, do have an advisor beyond this FASIA exam deadline. So um, we encourage you to do that. Um, also supporting our members' wellbeing is a high priority in 2021. Uh, we understand that the last few years have brought challenge upon challenge with, with rapid you know, red legislation, regulation, um, the Royal Commission, and, 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 and I guess the reputational damage that that caused. Uh, last year we saw the impacts of COVID um, and now we've got the education standards. So the AFA is here to support our members' wellbeing. Uh, we know how tough and challenging it has been. We've all experienced it. The board talks about it regularly, uh, how challenging it has been with this fast, fast pace of change and challenges. Um, we're hearing you that you, you want to meet face to face. Uh, last year was, was quite a challenge in that everybody had to quickly move to webinars uh, and alternative means to, to, to engage with their memberships. But the AFA has always prided, uh, prided itself on, on being a grassroots association and that's supported by a federated board model. Um, and we're working really hard and quickly to, to get uh, national events, I guess, rolled out locally. So that, that sorry, local events rolled out to our members can engage with one another, have a beer, talk about what, what's going on in their advisors, find a tribe. You know, we, we, we understand how important that is. The AFA values that. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit later to what the AFA is doing there. Um, we'll continue to do webinars as well, because I think that that's uh, a necessary way to communicate. And I think it's, it, it's one of those things we learned from 2020 was that webinars are uh, an effective way to communicate, but we also wholeheartedly believe in connecting, connecting personally and locally. Um, the AFA has been placing a lot of time and resource uh, really to try and tilt the pendulum in a way of sensible, um, sensible policy from the politicians. Uh, it is working um, and I believe that with, with the, the remaining Royal Commission recommendations kind of passing through now or, or quite soon, um, we believe that the government is aware and we've seen messages from the government that they're aware that changes need to be made to make advice more affordable and accessible. And, and then that needs to be addressed in terms of some regulatory changes to, uh, to reduce the cost of survey. Um, I, wanna, I wanna reaffirm that the AFA is completely behind life insurance advice. Um, 
and we're working, you know, behind the scenes at the moment on, on the uh, uh, the review of LIF, engaging with ASIC. Well, I think what's important there is we understood the scope of, of the ASIC review, and also there was greater transparency uh, in terms of uh, in terms of that review and how it was going to be conducted. And we believe that that's um, we've, we've gone a long way to achieving that. Um, we also believe it's very important that we empower our members and give them a voice, uh, and that's why we believe that. Um, we need to step up and, and, and uh, provide our members with some guidance and, and some uh, ways in which they can engage their local members. Um, and we'll be looking to do that. And I think the ASIC levy, which we'll talk to soon, is one area in which members need to be engaging um, their, their local politicians on. Uh, we always promote the value of advice when we're engaging with the government and regulators. Uh, and really, there's some great research that has come out recently to, to really demonstrate the value of advice. And, and it's, it's challenging times financially, but we will be looking to, to release that digitally and engage our members so that we can at least, in, in a way, promote the value of what we do and, and, and give our members some, some, again, empowerment to be able to, to do that within their, their networks. Um, finally, big deal, AFA is turning 75 this year. So uh, we're going to celebrate that all year. Uh, we're going to be rolling that out soon. But when you think about 75 years is a huge milestone for the AFA. Um, that's 75 years of, of an authentic advisor voice, of communities, of friendships, of mentorships. I've been getting some uh, testimonials from, from, from our past presidents and members, and it's just fantastic. Um, but that's, you know, 75 years of great advice. So we hope you can, can celebrate that with us throughout the year. Uh, next, please, Phil. Um, in terms of the, the challenges and opportunities, this year, like any other year, uh, is going to have these. And I, first and foremost, as I mentioned in my previous slide, is the um, we want as many advisors uh, as possible to, to be passing, uh, choosing to sit and pass the the FASIR exam. Um, we're here to support you. Uh, we want. If, if, if you need some guidance, some connection to, to, to local members or networks to help you through that, um, we're here for you. If you need some support from your licensees, we can help you direct you that way or via Cardinal Kaplan's doing some, some great preparation as is for SEER themselves now. Um, TEL's got some master classes. So if you need some guidance on that, please approach us or please approach your state committees or your, or your state director because we're more than happy to support you there and we think it's so important that you remain in advice uh, and continue to serve your clients because you know you do a great job. Uh, there's more legislation coming through. Uh, annual renewal is the latest one that we've seen. We know that this is adding more compliance, more cost uh, to serve. Uh, we're aware of that and we're, we're working with the government and, 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 and the regulators to try and make that as, as efficient as possible. But I just wanted to say, we understand that. We as advisors on the board, we're going through that as well. Uh, we know there's some challenges. Um, the next piece of, of major uh, legislation coming through is a single disciplinary disciplinary body. We've seen that the draft legislation isn't quite out yet, but we believe it's really important that the, the, the associations are engaged with this because we have so much to offer in terms of um, we want to see things like simplification of the regulatory regime. We don't want 6,000 regulators. We, we, we just want one uh, overseeing advice. Um, I think it was a good step to see that uh, Treasury uh, is now overseeing the, the FASIA um, code of conduct. Um, but also we need to see more things like how, how advice can be streamlined, how technology can play a role, how PI is going to be impacted, um, the role of licensees, all of those things. So there's a lot to go through there, a big chunk of work, and we'll be heavily, heavily involved in, in, in making that um, as best we can. Uh, look, we all know the great job that advisors did uh, during the COVID uh, COVID era of, of 2020. We're not quite through that yet, so hope, but hopefully we are. But we just knew the challenges that... Um, Australians face and how advisors helped manage the psychological and financial stresses uh, for Australians. But we need to acknowledge that, that, that financial advisors suffered stresses as well in terms of the changes to our business models, the inability to access clients, um, you know, meeting compliance needs, reviews, getting opt-in signed, form signed, etc. So um, look, hopefully we're through the worst of that, but it needs to be acknowledged that, that was a challenging period for advice. Um, life insurance uh, over the last few years, uh, is, is in an unprecedented state of premium rises. Uh, this has caused a lot of stress, I believe, for our clients. You know, they've seen premium rises significant. Um, and and it, really, the role of the advisors here, we've had to play a role in trying to uh, adjust the, the, the client's portfolios to, to man, ensure that these protections are maintained because that's so important. 
but uh, be able to adjust these to the client's needs and, and, and budgets. So I really want to commend, as, as an advisor, I've spent a lot of time on that over the last year, especially with income protection premiums. I really want to commend the role that advisors have played there because it's much better uh, working with an advisor to, 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 get, to, to, to adjust an outcome rather than clients lose all of their protection. Uh, there's also some uncertainty in the income protection market at the moment. Um, you know, with the new APRA directed products coming to the market. And I believe it's important that advisors understand how to manage, I like, guess, their best interest duty coming into an inferior product. Uh, so we've been looking to, to, with God, to get guidance from ASIC on how advisors can best do that, um, given that the new products are inferior to the old one, but then we're going to see the pressures of the premium increases continue. Um, there's also some other future legislation that's coming through. I'll leave most of this with Phil Anderson, because uh, he's the expert on all this, but I just want you to know that we are, some of these can be, have significant impact. So we are working with government and, and the regulators to, to get more sensible outcome in these areas. Uh, Phil, um, I just wanted to quickly go through, the AFA has, has um, come up with some policy principles that we're using to guide our, our, our policy formulation um, in the future. So a bit of a lens, if you will. So we believe that, um, you know, it needs to be acknowledged advice is professional and we are recognising growing profession. Uh, it's essential that advice is affordable and ac uh, accessible. Um, more efficient models need to be established. And, and also importantly, choice, uh, choice needs to be maintained for consumers. And that's uh, no more, uh, it's very important in terms of the life insurance space. But also advice, we, we need to ensure that it's valued and easy to understand and valued by all the community. So these are the, the principles that we're working on um, when we're drafting a, a policy. Um, next, please, Phil. Uh, some recent, I wanted to bring to you some recent research that has been done uh, via IWF and Core Data. Um, this is the most comprehensive research that's been done with advised clients. Um, you can see there are 11,600 odd advised clients were surveyed, I think it was June last year, uh, about the benefits of, of financial advice. And um, it clearly demonstrated, you can see there, that the professional advice delivers a whole range of tangible benefits. Um, what I think is really important here, and, and uh, Phil Anderson has referred to this as, as the missing voice. So when we're talking to government, et cetera, this is the voice of our clients completely and utterly endorsing uh, the value of advice. We, we haven't had this before, so we're going to be able to use this information when advocating um, with, with, with regulators and government, but also advocating um, the media and, and consumers on the value of advice. Um, Phil will probably allude to later on, you've, you've got these consumer groups that, that so-called represent consumers, but you know, are they really engaging consumers and getting their data from consumers, or are they just basing this on, on what they believe in? This is uh, this is very powerful data to uh, that um, that does comprehensively um, demonstrate that financial advice is of value, um, and and I'd go and check that out if, if you can. Um, next slide, please, Phil. I want to spend a bit of time on, on, on detailing our industry-wide collaboration. Um, this is more about how we collaborate rather than the policy issues, which Phil will go through later. Um, the AFA spends a lot of time, you know, frequently engaging and, and proactively engaging with a key range of stakeholders. I want to go through those. I guess key is the politicians, you know, in Parliament. Uh, we're engaging with the Minister, Senator Hume, uh, and also the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg's office. Uh, as he's responsible for the Royal Commission recommendations. Uh, we haven't got a, a, as good as results, of, I'll be frank here, a, a, as we wanted to in a lot of these things. So what we've done is we've got a deliberate strategy as well to engage with the backbenchers of the government. Um, as an example, I, I have close relationships with Bert Van and Amanda Stoker, who I'm, I'm frequently talking to. Um, our Vice President, Sam Pereira, um, has, a, has a good working relationship with Jason Falinski. And, and over in WA, Stephen Knight, um, many of you will know, um, engages regularly with, with, with Senator Slade Brockman, Brockman, sorry, who was uh, Matthias Cormans, Matthias Cormans ex chief of staff and, and Ben Morton, who's the secretary of the PM. So what we've uh, been able to do is convert, uh, uh, educate these backbenchers on the value of advice and convert them really to be advocates for what we do. And, and, and in part of room discussions, et cetera, they, can talk, they are talking up for the value of what we do. Um, some of the wins that we've had, I, I probably need to, um, Go through some of those was, was I guess the fear extension for fear extension back in 2019. We were able to to get some um, simplifications of the annual renewal process uh, at, the, at the end of last year. I think key to that was getting 
the, the opt-in or the annual renewal document required to be signed in one, one place rather than three places because we all know how clients love signing three documents instead of one, right? Um, and uh, we, we, we were very proactive in working towards those COVID exemptions that were granted last year by ASIC. Um, and more recently, you are seeing a dialogue by the government and ASIC in terms of need to, to streamline advice and, and reduce the barriers. Um, and, and ASIC has come out with its unmet advice in this project that we've been engaging with them on. Um, we are engaging with the opposition as well. Uh, we, many of you would have seen the comments by Stephen Jones regarding life insurance. So we've, uh, we've, we've, we're, you know, representing our members. We're engaging with him at least quarterly by webinars to educate him on the value of advice, particularly risk advice. Um, we, we meet regularly with, with, with ASIC and, um, and Treasury, who are responsible for the Royal Commission recommendations. We also do collaborate with the other associations. Uh, I want to make this point really clear that we do work in with the, uh, with the FBA, with the SMSF, SMSF Association, with the Stock Brokers, Stock Brokers Association, with the accountancy bodies. Um, we are working together uh, for, for, the, for the benefit of all advisors. Um, uh, as an example, the AFA and the FBI had the Joint Life Insurance Task Force, uh, which, uh, which we're using as a platform to engage with APRA and ASIC uh, and all of those issues that, that financial, you know, on, on the claims, uh, claims handling as well was another one that we've, we've been recently been working on. Um, we are completely in favour of retaining commissions. And we've also been working with, with the government, um, uh, sorry, not with government, with the other life insurance company and the the choice, the Cali Group, the choice and access to life insurance advice. I can, I can tell you uh, that the, the life insurance companies are behind our retaining commissions as well, and we are all working together to educate government on that. I think we're going to Canberra last week, and you can see down there that, that great photo of me with my eyes closed. That, that Phil and I were down, Phil Anderson and I were down there at the um, end of February uh, meeting with the treasurer's office with uh, members of um, uh, AIA and, and MetLife. Um, that's next slide, please, Phil. That's all from me in terms of the strategy, uh, also the priorities uh, update and the welcome. Um, before I go, I did want to do a, uh, a pulse check um, about how um, you all feel about the future of advice. So it would, I would really appreciate to get your feedback up there. Uh, what you need to do is just click on the polls button down at the bottom of the screen, please. So we'll give you 30 seconds for this. Um, I can see that going. So first answer is everything's heading in the right direction, positive and looking forward to financial advice being broadly recognized as a profession. Or we've had a tough few years, but maybe things are starting to look up. Uh, the last few years have been a struggle. I'm not sure whether I, uh, sure I wish to remain in the sector in the long term or I cannot see a viable future for myself or financial advice and I'm ready uh, to plan my exit. So I hope there's not too many of that. We'll just give you another 10 seconds. Okay. We can end that polling. Um, and um, and now we'd like to go to uh, 20 questions. I'm just thinking, six, six, uh, question B received most of the responses there, which is good to see. Um, question one, 30, 30%, uh, answer one, sorry, 30, 30%, B, 47%, oh, sorry, uh, A was 18%, B, 47%, C, 29%, and D, 7%. Um, so I'll just go to Nat to see if there's any questions. Natalie? Uh, hi, Mike. So uh, just uh, one question around um, how close is the AFA and FPA in collaboration to get onto one page with uh, advocacy and, and policy uh, on behalf of all advice as a profession? So you've, you've touched on that a little bit. Did you want to make any more comments? Yeah, yeah happy to make some comments on there. And Bill Anderson, if you want to chime in as well, because I know you're doing a lot of work um, on the policy front. But we, 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 we do... Uh, we do. We are looking to work closely on um, areas in which we we both agree on. So, as I mentioned before, you've got the joint life insurance framework uh, task force. Sorry, we, we're both joined at the hip. We, we, we're doing that together. Um, and also, I, we, we're looking at ways in which we can work that, that better together so that we can comprehensively re represent both members. Uh, Phil, have you got some examples? Well, obviously, the, uh, the best example is the way we pulled the joint task force together to work on life insurance, which is a primary 
objective of retaining commissions as an option for clients into the future. But, but that's just one of the ways that we, uh, we dialogue on a regular basis and, uh, and share intel. Um, uh, and we have in the past uh, also met with politicians on a joint basis. So we'll continue to do that uh, on a go forward basis. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a, a question around the uh, FASIR exam. Is there any opportunity for the AFA to request a further extension, um, especially given the many challenges and ongoing changes and implementations of the RC? That's something that we, we have been raising with the government regularly, uh, but we haven't really had any indication that the government is willing to do that um, to date. Okay. I think we, would, uh, we will be very closely monitoring the progress during the course of this year. Um, and then as a, as a result of that, if, if we're not seeing the sort of progress that we might have expected, those, those conversations will certainly be uh, on the agenda. Yeah. If you are looking to do the exam, we do encourage you though to, 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 to take um, the sitting, you know, uh, uh, in the short term, to, to make the decision to do it um, in the next few months to give yourself, um, you know, the best chance of it. To, to get it get it completed. And uh, there's a couple of uh, questions that have come through with regards to uh, the income protection changes and also the upcoming lift review. So we might leave those until uh, Phil Anderson um, completes the, the, the policy update. I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll be answered uh, there. So that's it for questions for now. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thanks for listening. And I'll, um, I'll hand over now to Phil Anderson to give you the, uh, the, the policy update. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Mike. We'll, uh, we'll kick off talking about the FASIA uh, exam and to give you an update on where that is up to at the moment. As at the end of the November 2020 exam, which is the last uh, exam that we've got public results from, there had been 13,400 attempts. And I, I'm saying attempts because uh, it doesn't mean advisors because some advisors had attempted the exam multiple times. Of those, 11,200 advisors have passed the exam. Now, as at that point, that represented 53% of the advisors on the financial advisor register, which out of interest has now more recently fallen to around 20,750 advisors. The pass rate in terms of across all the sittings has been 83%. But when you take into account that some advisors uh, have sat the exam multiple times and, um, and through that they have ultimately been successful, 89.5% of advisors who have attempted the exam so far have passed. Now, I think the point that is a little concerning to many is that the pass rate for resitters is 59%. That's something that we are very conscious of. And it's also something that FASIA are very conscious of as well. And they are hearing more and more from those advisors who have been struggling to get through the exam. And as a result, they have committed to doing more to help the advisor population get through. Now that has included them starting a, a webinar program that they'll be running for everyone who is sitting the next exam. And this is something that we strongly encourage advisors to participate in. It is free. Um, so it's something from FASIA for free. And it's gonna be very useful to understand the way the exam is run. And also most importantly, and most relevantly, even for those who sat the exam, they'll talk about what the obstacles are. And they talk about how people are overthinking questions, how people are struggling with the stress of the exam. So it's very useful that um, people participate in that webinar and they get that feedback. Now, Mike has already referred to the fact that there's other support material out there and. And obviously, Kaplan have their program, which, uh, which they've made free for the first half of this year. So congratulations to them on that. And also TAL and the TAL Risk Academy, who also provide training for the exam that has been very well regarded by the advisor population. 
So if you go looking uh, for what the CEO are doing, they've got a media release on the 18th of February talking about how they are going to be providing more help for advisors to get through the exam. And this will necessarily need to be a very big focus for FASEA uh, this year. Now, the question about an extension, I don't think anyone should be operating on the assumption that there's going to be a further extension. There is no indication to, see, to suggest that's going to be possible. So please try and book in your exam um, schedule for as soon as possible. If you do it early, then you've got more chance to sit it again down the track if you need to. And anyone who sat either the January or the March exam will have up to three attempts this year if they need it. I want to just go, now go to a, a poll question. I think that the, uh, the, the government is starting to watch the, the status very closely. And as we know, with just five exams left, time is running out, the, um, the, the January results will be released sometime towards the middle or the, the second half of March, and that's going to be a key indicator. But we're carefully monitoring the number of people who are sitting the exam each time. So I'm just going to quickly roll into this next poll question. And if I can uh, ask people to answer the question, on the, uh, their status with the exam. All right, we've got, uh, we've got uh, the numbers running through but very quickly. We've got uh, 170 responses already. So that's, that's fantastic. I'll just give it a few more, few more seconds. I think people are getting pretty close All right, we'll, uh, we'll close it out there and I'll share those results. Um, very, uh, very interesting outcome there. You know, 55% of those who responded have passed the exam, which is broadly consistent, although slightly better than the overall population. 7% uh, have sat the exam but not yet passed and, and, and they're the group that, that we're keen to support as much as we can. 26% have not yet sat the exam but intend to this year and 12% who do not intend to sit the exam. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, that's, that's useful information for us in our advocacy going forward. Let's keep moving on. Now I want to talk also about more broadly the changes that have been made to FASEA there was a, a key announcement on the 9th of December last year from both Minister Hume, but also the Treasurer, uh, Josh Frydenberg. Now, they announced that uh, they were pushing on with the establishment of a single disciplinary body, and as part of that process, winding up the SEA. The single disciplinary body was a recommendation of the Royal Commission, and that's one of the remaining key uh, reforms and key pieces of legislation that we're waiting for. They have proposed that ASIC's Financial Services and Credit Panel, which is a panel that has been set up by ASIC that includes external uh, industry experts to assess particular disciplinary matters, will be the vehicle going forward for managing the disciplinary regime when the disciplinary regime will be extended to not only breaches of the law, but breaches of the code. And the FSCP will also be responsible for the ongoing administration of the exam. Policy matters will be transferred to Treasury and ultimately the minister will have the say. So that's with respect to policies like the education standard or the code of ethics. Um, and other policy related matters, which could include things like the professional year, uh, where we're so keen to get as many new advisors into the profession as we can. Now, the time frame for this is not yet clear. What we do know is that exposure draft legislation should be released fairly shortly, but the government has committed to at least tabling the legislation in the parliament by the middle of the year, so by June. Now, what we want to see as an outcome of this 
is one regulator for financial advice, one set of rules, one code, one disciplinary regime, and one sensible manageable fee to cover whatever cost the government seeks to recover. We think there is great opportunity in getting this single disciplinary body done right to ensure that we achieve those objectives. Now I want to talk about our remaining FASEA advocacy objectives. And I need to make the point that until there is a new model in place, FASEA is very much still part of the regime and we will continue to work constructively with FASEA um, over this period of time. And, and it may still be quite some time before, uh, before the, the legislation leads to the ultimate um, winding down of FASEA. They remain critically important in their administration of the exam. And we need to make sure that they are available to help people as much as possible. We also want FASEA to continue to work on the code of ethics. We have long objected to standard three, and we believe that there is an overwhelming level of support across the uh, advice profession and more broadly for changes to be made to standard three. We would like to see that happen whilst FASEA is still uh, responsible for the code, uh, and we will continue to be advocating for that. We also think that there's great opportunity to support the, the sector as we look to get more people into financial advice, more people getting into the professional year. Now, on this, I just want to answer um, a particularly common question that we get which is a call for a different regime for risk advisors. There have been people say, come out and say, well, risk advisors are different. Why can't there be a different regime, a different education standard that applies to risk advisors? Now, our response to this is based upon the fact that during the entire FASEA um, course, we've seen no appetite from government or from FASEA for there to be more than one regime that would apply to individual pockets. And we have to say that this same um, call has been made by a number of parties. It's certainly been made by uh, the stockbrokers who want stockbrokers to be treated differently. So in terms of framing up our policy in this space and, and what we're advocating for, we're very cognizant of the fact that it's unlikely that there'll be fundamental change to the overall regime. So the best way that we can see to get a more sensible outcome for risk advisors is through a couple of things. We want to see better recognition for experience and specifically recognition for diploma courses that have been done in the past and for CPD. We have proposed a number of times in the past that this could be facilitated by giving free subjects credit to anyone who has more than 15 years experience. Two subjects for anyone between 10 and 15 years and one subject for anyone between five and 10 years. We also wanna see greater flexibility in terms of the study that needs to be undertaken so that risk advisors can focus on studying um, content that is relevant to them, of interest to them and also relevant uh, to both them and their clients. And we feel that if we can get better recognition for experience, greater flexibility in terms of the study that needs to be undertaken, then that will mean that risk advisors will be closer to getting the end outcome and they'll also be able to do further study that is most relevant to them. We see this is the most practical way of getting a sensible solution for the risk population to ensure that as many risk advisors can stay in the advice market uh, as is possible. And I'm happy um, that we might take questions on that later on. Let's now move on to the Royal Commission. Uh, I want to give you an update on, on the two key pieces of Royal Commission legislation that have gone through over the last uh, three months or so. Uh, and we're going to focus on the bill that was passed 
in the Senate in December of last year. This was a very large piece of legislation. It did not go uh, to an inquiry, uh, which is often the case with a parliamentary inquiry, whether that's the PJC or the Senate Economics Committee. It did not have a regulation impact statement. And in fact, it was barely even de debated in the Senate. Our fear is that these bills are going through without due process, and therefore they are leaving both the financial services sector, but also the client of advisors exposed. Now, I just want to talk through some key parts of this. You've all probably heard of this requirement for there to be a claim handling um, authorization or license. And we have strongly said that should not be a requirement for financial advisors who are already licensed or authorized and already are bound by the best interest duty. Now, we have seen so far that the government has put out a draft regulation to provide an exemption from that for financial advisors. We uh, provided feedback to that in, in January. And our feedback was that it wasn't clear enough and it needs to be extended to include the staff of financial advice practices. We will get the final regulation in the middle of April, uh, and we are very much hoping that that will remove this issue for the advisor population. Mandatory reference checking is a, uh, a new obligation that is going to start from the 1st of October this year. It will place a legal obligation on licensees to seek a reference check for anyone that they're in the process of recruiting. And it also will place an obligation on an existing or former licensee to provide a reference check. Now, ASIC are going to stipulate the template that needs to apply, um, and we'll wait to see the final outcome there over the next couple of months. This is going to be a, a new process that will be uh, an important process. It will unfortunately add to the cost of running a license fee, but we actually think uh, reference checking is a really important process that needs to be followed as part of the recruiting exercise. And we certainly want to ensure that um, the profession holds on to good advisors, but where there are issues, uh, they do need to be appropriately considered before recruitment decisions are made. Another big uh, part of this bill in December was the new breach reporting requirement. Now, I, I recognise that this is more of a licence fee issue, but ultimately it does flow down to advisors because no advisor wants to be reported to ASIC and neither do you want a, a breach that may have been reported to ASIC to be included as part of a reference check. So it is an important issue for advisors and it's one that we need to continue to fight for because the new breach reporting regime is in our view uh, excessive, over the top, uh, impractical. It will see a substantial explosion in the number of breaches that get reported to ASIC. And that is because the old definition of what a significant breach is has been substantially expanded to include any civil penalty provision. And whilst the government um, this morning has released some draft regulations that will limit some of the breaches that would otherwise need to be reported. It is our view that it is still excessive and will lead to significant um, administrative effort by licensees to report matters that are very minor. And I'm talking about things like breaches of the best interest duty, record keeping requirements, or um, small errors in FDS but I'll talk more about that in a moment. And there are also then related obligations that flow through from breach reporting or the investigations that might be required as part of breach reporting to include obligations to notify impacted clients and to undertake um, more comprehensive remediation programs. So um, many of these changes uh, start from the 1st of October. The claims handling exemption is active, actually uh, one that um, applications for variations to licenses would need to be submitted by the 30th of June. As I said, we expect a regulation 
to exempt advisors, but it is something to watch closely. Now, in, in the conversations that we have about legislation, I might talk about legislation, regulation, and legislative instruments. I just want to quickly provide context. Legislation is the bills that get debated and passed in the parliament. Regulations are laws that are put in place by ministers. So they come with the authorization of the minister and also through, uh, through the normal process, the governor general has to sign off on them. That is an important layer of legislation that is subject to a different level of oversight. They can be disallowed in the parliament, but they are not um, debated in the parliament unless there's a motion to disallow. And then legislative instruments are, are other forms of rules that are put in place. And from uh, our experience, we've seen them put in place by a FASIA or by uh, ASI, or for that matter, in, in other contexts by the TPB. So that provides you a little bit of context when we talk about legislation, regulation, and legislative instruments. All right, now the next bill that I do want to talk about is the second Hain Royal Commission response bill that was um, tabled in the parliament on the 9th of December. And then it was debated through both the, the House of Representatives and was passed in the Senate on the 25th of February. This bill included three main areas, the annual renewal obligation, and I'll talk more about that, a new requirement for a disclosure of lack of independence, which will be done through financial services guides. And that's going to start from the 1st of July this year. And it can be done immediately through a, a fundamental change in your FSG or a supplementary FSG. And you're simply going to need to detail all the reasons um, why you don't comply with the requirements for using the term independence which is in uh, section 923A of the Corporations Act. And the final uh, part of this bill was new requirements about charging advice fees through superannuation, which in, in many ways is linked back to the annual renewal obligation. But there was one other key part of this, which is a banning of ongoing um, advisor service fees from my super account. It will be possible, uh, contrary to the Royal Commission recommendation to still charge one-off fees to my super accounts, but ongoing fees will no longer be able to be charged from my super. Now that will start uh, for new clients from the 1st of July this year and for existing clients from the 1st of July next year. So any advisors who have my super clients on um, ongoing advisor service fees that's something that you will need to respond to. Um, final point about uh, from this slide is the annual renewal starts on the 1st of July this year. However, there is a 12 month transition arrangement. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I think we will need to come back and do a separate session on annual renewal because it is such a big change. If I talk through um, those changes in a little bit more detail, uh, this new regime will apply to all ongoing fee clients. In the past, we had um, an exclusion from uh, the renewal requirement for pre-FOFA clients, so pre-1 July 2013 clients. That will cease, so all ongoing fee clients, uh, whenever they commence, will now be caught. And it will also be extended so it's not just every two years, it's every year. Now, Mike earlier on talked about the important changes that had been made since the first draft of this legislation that was released in February, in January of 2020. Uh, and we responded to in February of 2020, and we continue to advocate on throughout the course of last year. And we were very pleased to see that there were some sensible changes that got made as a result. Nonetheless, the new annual renewal legislation is going to require significantly more, and it will cost more to provide these uh, requirements. So not only is it going to be focused on the services and fees paid over the last 12 months, 
but also the services that will be provided over the next 12 months and the fees that will be charged. Now, where that fee is on an, um, on an unknown amount, as in an asset-based fee arrangement, say where you're charging um, 1% or 0.8% of the assets under advice, you won't know for sure because the amount will ultimately depend upon the asset values over the course of the year. So the legislation is going to require you to provide an estimate, but you'll also need to include in the fee disclosure statement the basis under which you, you have prepared that estimate. Now this is going to add significantly to the complexity of using an asset-based fee arrangement. We are very conscious of this and we have continue to advocate for how this can be done as simply as possible. Client consent forms must also be provided to product providers each year. And this, this is not just in the super space, it's also uh, in the investment space. Now I have to say right from the outset, annual renewal does not apply to clients who are only paying a premium for life insurance. If they are paying um, a fee for life insurance that's an ongoing fee, uh, then those um, annual renewal obligations will apply. But if all they are paying is, um, is an ongoing uh, premium and a commission is taken out of that, then they are not caught under this regime. Now, the, um, uh, the key date going forward is what's going to be known as the anniversary date. Now for new clients, this will be the day that the arrangement is first put in place. For existing clients, it is going to be influenced by what happens during the course of the transition year. Now I wanna also talk to the time frame. So consistent with uh, the previous uh, regime, the FDSs will need to be provided within 60 days. A key change though, is that clients will have up to 120 days to respond. So over the course of that 120 days, the ongoing fee arrangement will stay in place. Now, if for example, the advisor can issue the fee disclosure statement within 30 days, then they will have another 90 days for the client to provide consent. And this is one of the significant improvements that was made from the current model and also the draft legislation. At the moment, you only have 30 days to get the client to renew. Now this will give much more flexibility and it means that if clients are away, um, then there'll be time for them to come back. If they're dealing with other issues, you'll have more time to get them to consent. If they don't consent within the 120 days, then a further 30 days afterwards, the ongoing fee arrangement will be terminated. Um, and that's equally what applies to product providers. So I think part of this is a positive. Um, and we've got to look to the fact that there is more flexibility and the rationalization of the FDS and renewal being done as one document is a positive. Having said that though, we are not comfortable with everything where it's landed. And I just want to reinforce some of the things that we have been advocating for strongly since the legislation was first tabled in December last year. We want there to be more flexibility in being able to bring the anniversary date forward without needing to go through an entire process of putting a new ongoing fee arrangement in place. At the moment, the legislation doesn't allow that. We also want to have the legislation fix a problem that has been apparent for the last two years, which is around timing differences, because fees might be taken out of the client's account um, a period of time before they're actually paid to the license fee. And that may mean that FDSs don't reconcile in terms of when the money was taken out of the account as opposed to when it was paid to the licensee. And all advisors know that their FDSs are done based upon their systems, not based upon the product system. And when ASIC came out and said, you need to go back and check, 
we immediately said, well, that is completely impractical. We need to have a better solution. And in our view, this legislation was the vehicle where it was possible to deal with those timing differences and differences that might flow from GST versus RITC or just very small mistakes. During the tra transition year, advisors will be able to choose when they provide the new FDS. So you will be able to delay it a little bit more than the normal cycle. And I think we need to run another session to go through the detail on this. Um, but what we're saying is that the new anniversary date should be based upon the FDS end date, the end of the 12 month period during that transition year, not the date that it was provided to the client. We've also said that there needs to be a simple solution for asset-based fee arrangements. The estimate should be high level and we, it should be based upon information known at the time. It should not need to do any detailed modeling of what might happen in the future. And we also have argued that it would have been appropriate to have provided more time. This is about to start in three and a half months. It's not a lot of time for both licensees and advisors to prepare and where there are system changes that are, are needed, which will be the case, uh, it is going to be difficult. I do want to remind you though, there is a 12 month transition. So um, we will be able to work through this in that 12 month transition, but work will need to start early. Now I just want to uh, bring your attention to a speech that was made during the course of the debate in the Senate on the 25th of February. It's not often that you get to see a speech that was quite brief, but was, was very, very wise. And, and look, I have to acknowledge the good work that many of our members are doing in Western Australia with people like Senator Slade Brockman. Mike referred to him before, um, but it is so important that we are getting out there and we are talking to politicians um, from both sides of the house, but also helping them to understand the complexity that legislation is adding to the world of financial advice. So I'm just gonna reflect upon a couple of key points that, that Senator Slade Brockman made during this speech. Royal commissioners and royal commissions do not have a font of pure wisdom. Government should not simply implement everything they say. Government should consider it. And then they should make their own decisions based upon what's in the best interest of the country and the client, including those silent voices, existing clients, who are, as a result of this legislation, going to go through extra um, process, extra documents to sign, and it will cost them more as a result. Senator Brockman also emphasized his concern about what was happening to the cost of advice and how this may impact access and affordability for uh, everyday Australians. He even, through the course of his speech, opened the prospect that the time frame, the frequency of renewal could be reconsidered in the future. He said one year is not a magical number, perhaps two years is a more sensible outcome. And he called on the parliament to keep thinking about these things. We have to recognize those politicians who are speaking up in the best interest of advisors and their clients to call for more rational considered um, debate on these important reforms. Okay, there are other reforms still to come and I'll do this, uh, cover this very briefly. The single disciplinary body. I've talked, talked about this already, um, what we want, but this legislation will come uh, at, um, through draft, um, exposure draft legislation over the, the next couple of months and then legislation expected to be tabled in the parliament by 30 June. Compensation scheme of last resort. This is another one that could add significantly to the cost of running um, advice practices and running licensees, where advisors through licensees would be expected to cover unpaid um, AFCA determinations 
um, over the future. Now, um, the, the numbers suggest that this could add a reasonable amount to ongoing fees. And we need to make sure that any compensation scheme of last resort um, doesn't just hit out at those who are the last resort to take action against in the case of a complaint. If the product provider fails and the advisor is the only one left to take action against, then we don't want the compensation scheme of last resort just to focus on advisors. There is another review that uh, Commissioner Hain called for in 2022, and, and we've got the, the recommendation there. This review is going to look at the impact of the changes that have been recommended in terms of the, the impact they might have on the quality of advice. He's also asked that this review will have a close look at any, any remaining conflicts of interest. And he's asked the question as to whether the safe harbour steps in the best interest duty should be retained. Now, if we talk about uh, the last of the key recommendations, which Haynes said the ASIC lift review in 2021 should proceed and any decision should be made on the basis of that. We are obviously very focused on arguing for the retention of life insurance commissions as an option for clients to choose. Sure, if they want to pay a fee, then they should have that option. But if they want to pay for their advice through a commission, then absolutely that should be kept. Now, ASIC have um, communicated to the market that they have commenced this review. They're starting by looking at files from May of 2017. They've issued notices to something over 120 licensees. They're looking to gather 500 files. Later this year, they will also start calling for files from this year. They will be doing a comparison between the results that are um, recorded from the May 2017 files versus the 2021 files. This process is going to take some time to play out because they need to, first of all, get all of those files, but they also need to carefully review them. And so we don't expect the final results of the lift review to be released until the second half of next year. And that is going to be very critical. It will be something that we will be actively involved in. But once it's released, it will then be in the hands of the government. And by that point, we may have had an election or we will have had an election. So it will be in the hands of the new government to decide what they choose to do. But certainly right across the life insurance industry and right across the advice profession, we are united in calling for the retention of life insurance commissions. And ultimately, whether that rate stays at the current rate of 60% will be something that we will need to argue for at the time that we have ensured the retention of commissions. Now, I just want to quickly reflect upon some of the things that have been said quite recently through um, some of the, the consultation exercises that have been undertaken uh, most, most recently. And look, this is, um, this is something that has played out uh, over the course of the early part of this year through submissions that have been made um, to ASIC's consultation on affordable advice. And Mike talked about uh, what some of the activist groups have said. Now, I just think it's really important in the context of the 2022 review that advisors know that there are still these activist groups out there that are calling for things like a banning on asset-based fees. They are continuing to call for the removal of all conflict. We understand that we have a battle in front of us to continue to defend some of these remuneration arrangements that have worked in the interest of clients and clients continue to be happy to support. Um, but it is important that you have that context. Let us now talk about the ASIC funding levy. And you will have seen quite a bit of media coverage over the course of the last week. The ASIC funding levy for the 2019-20 year, so this is the year that is now 
some eight months uh, since it finished, is going to be 1,500 per license fee plus 2,426 per advisor, which is an increase per advisor from 934 in the 2017 18 year and 1,142 in the 18 19 year. An increase of 112% in one year and 160% in two years. Now it is apparent to us that this increase has been driven as a result of ASIC enforcement action against large institutions as a result of the Royal Commission cases. This is expenditure that has been approved by the government, but it seems most inequitable that it would be individual small business financial advice practices that are paying for this cost. And it does highlight a fundamental flaw in the ASIC levy model. ASIC are simply processing these invoices as they are required to do by the ASIC funding body model, which is a legislation from the parliament and a regulation from the government. In June of last year, ASIC issued an estimate of $1,571 per advisor. Now we wrote to both Minister Hume and Minister Morton at that time, calling for it to be looked at, calling for it to either be waived in the context of COVID-19 or at least capped at the 18-19 level. In December, we, were, we discovered this new number of 2,426. We wrote to Minister Hume, we wrote to ASI. We issued them with a, please explain. How is it possible that this could have gone up by so much in just one year? We have been speaking to a number of politicians since, asking them to advocate on our behalf. We've raised this issue with the Treasurer's office. We encourage members to raise their concerns about this with their local member of parliament. We referred to that in our member communication yesterday, and we will provide more material to support that uh, over the next week or so. This, in our view, is simply unreasonable, certainly in the context of COVID-19, particularly where it appears that it has been driven by enforcement action, which is so totally unrelated to the vast majority of the advisor population. <coughs> um, let me just talk about the access and affordability work uh, that is not only just being done by ASIC, but I think it's being increasingly recognised by the parliament and, and right across our regulators, that it is simply too costly to provide financial advice. And that issue of affordability is impacting clients' access to advice. It's also when tied up with the issue of the significantly declining number of financial advisors is making financial advice so much more difficult to get for everyday Australians. We're increasingly seeing the trend of advisors increasing their fees, focusing on clients who have um, greater capacity to pay higher fees. Now, we have contributed to this um, consultation process by ASIC, and we've called for a range of things. We've said that there needs to be a substantial increase in regulatory certainty. At the moment, license fees operate on the basis of higher levels of uncertainty and therefore need to be more risk adverse in the way they frame their own rules. And that is absolutely understandable when there are so many, I guess, unanswered questions, some of which we put forward in our consultation response. We're also looking for cross industry and cross regulatory um, consultation and process improvement. We need to have a dialogue that brings the issues from the coal face right into the faces of those who are ultimately making the decision. We want to see a regulatory regime that is viewed through the eyes of small business. 
Now, I could take you through in more detail the new um, breach reporting legislation, but let me just say, this is not a piece of legislation that is understandable by average advisors. It is something you're gonna need compliance or legal help with. It is ridiculously complex. We need to have our legislation and our guidance drafted in a way that is easy to follow by the very many small business financial advice licensees and practices. We also want ASIC to focus on prevention of compliance failures rather than regulatory intervention and remediation. The, um, the thing about the ASIC funding levy that stands out is how much money is spent on enforcement versus how much money is spent on education and guidance. And that balance, in our view, needs to be addressed. Um, I'm just about at the end of my regulatory update, and I know that I'm giving a very uh, broad download of so much that's been going on. But I do want to talk about life insurance. I want to bring to your attention the um, further changes that are likely to happen in the income protection market. And you might find it interesting uh, that ASIC, sorry, APRA came out yesterday and, and warned the group supermarket <clears throat> in terms of life insurance. This is a little bit like the process that the individual um, market went through over the course of 2019. Now, in terms of the APRA intervention, we already know uh, that um, uh, agreed value has been, has been banned and, and that came in from the 1st of April last year. But there is a range of other changes that APRA has mandated which will start from the 1st of October this year. And some of the key parts of this is that income at risk can only be based upon income um, at the time of claim. Now they've, they've termed that in terms of the last 12 months, but they did at least give some flexibility for occupations where income is variable. Now that the um, implementation of this will be left in the hands of the life insurers but it will mean that the income will be averaged over a longer period that's appropriate to particular occupations where it is more variable. The income replacement ratio will be capped at 70%, except for the first six months where it can be as high as 90%. And once again, they're continuing with this concept of the contract term being for a limit of five years, but with clients having the ability to renew their contract or refresh their contract where underwriting and health will no longer be required, but financial underwriting and pastime underwriting will, will now be required. I also want to give um, a heads up on the fact that the Actuaries Institute have been doing further work on the IDI market, and they are proposing a range of things. Now, ultimately, we'll need to wait and see whether this is picked up by APRA or by the life insurers, but the actuaries are proposing some changes such as own occupation would be limited for the first two years, a cap on income replacement ratio of 60%, but only for those under um, 240,000, it would scale back for amounts above 240,000. It would also be limited to 75% in the first six months. They have suggested through what they're calling a reference product, which they're not saying would be mandated, but would be strongly encouraged, would be that there'd be a maximum benefit age of 60. And the waiting period would be between 30 and 180 days. They're also through this proposal, putting a lot more focus on return to work initiatives. I think it's important that advisors have the context that there is more um, discussion in the marketplace that could lead to further changes to uh, the income protection product. Now, finally, to conclude, and, and Mike has already talked about the joint task force that we have with the FPA on life insurance. This was set up with the primary objective of advocating for the retention of life insurance commission. I think you can take that as a signal that 
both the FDA and the AFA strongly support that as an outcome. We are saying that client must have the ability to choose. So we've used this task force as a vehicle to um, advocate and argue for a range of things. Going back to 2019, we advocated with respect to the issue of client consent for life insurance clients. We argued why it should not be necessary to go back and get consent from existing life insurance clients. Life insurance is a very different proposition. The proposition in many ways is based upon advisors being there at time of claim. And we would certainly not want to remove clients' ability to call on their financial advisor at time of claim. Although having said that, the AFA has a strong view that advisors must be there for clients at the time of claim if you are continuing to receive a renewal commission for that client. We've also used the task force to argue about uh, the design of the lift review methodology. We've used it to talk more broadly with regulators about our concerns about premium increases and to provide feedback to APRA on the income protection intervention and the Actuaries Institute and their lobbying around further IDII changes. We've also used it as, as the platform to work more closely with the life insurers as we all seek to argue as strongly as we possibly can for the retention of life insurance commissions when the ASIC review report is handed down at the end of 2022. Now, I just want to um, conclude with a quick poll question on life insurance advice. We are hearing increasingly that people are choosing no longer to be a generalist in the life insurance space and stepping away and leaving it to the specialist. So if we can ask you for your feedback on whether you continue to give life insurance uh, advice. So I'm just launching that, uh, that poll now. If I can ask people to uh, respond to this poll. And I think this is, this is important data that we can use to provide feedback to the market um, that there are people who are choosing to leave uh, the life insurance advice space because it's too difficult to make an income with a 60% cap in the context of the costs that, that flow through at the moment with uh, all the complexity around um, complying with the best interest duty, all the complexity that will going forward flow as a result of the, um, uh, the changes that have been made to the income protection product. So I'll share those results now. Um, we, we're seeing that uh, only a small number have, have never provided advice, but we are seeing that 17% of those who have previously provided life insurance advice have chosen to stop because it's too difficult. 73% are continuing to give life insurance advice, although noting that it is much more difficult. And there are 7% who might fit in that category of risk specialists who are continuing despite the challenges, but, but business is going well. And there are pockets who are telling us that um, COVID has provided a particular incentive in the life insurance space. Um, so that's interesting news and we appreciate your feedback on that. We will now um, pass over to, to Nat and I can see that there's a lot of questions that have been flowing through. So Nat, um, over to you. Mike and myself will be available to answer any questions that uh, you want to put to us. Thank you, Phil. Now, there is quite a few questions around annual renewal. So we, we did say we will issue uh, and, and do that as, as a separate webinar. Um, we have a question here around the recent significant pricing increases announced by some providers. Um, have we got some comments there around uh, what AFA is doing in this space? 
Yeah, we, we do. Um, we've, we've raised these concerns through the course of last year. Um, the point being that, uh, and we're seeing most of the more material increases in the income protection market. And in particular, I think it's been very concerning to see very substantial premium increases for level premium business. Now, we recognise that the income protection product has been uh, unprofitable and, and highly unprofitable in recent years. So we understood that there was going to be a need for some adjustment, but it is really concerning to see the scale of it. Uh, so we have been raising this as an issue with the, with the regulators. We are, um, we've, we've raised concerns with the insurers. Um, ultimately, uh, APRA expects the life insurers to fix the sustainability issue in their, in their book. Um, but we're most concerned about how it's going to impact some of these what are now legacy products and particularly agreed value clients. There is no simple solution for it um, and it's going to be a very uncomfortable adjustment process. Mike, do you want to contribute anything more on that? Yeah, thanks, Phil. It's something that the, that the AFA, FPA Joint Life Insurance Task Force uh, took, took keen interest in and, and we wrote to, I know we wrote to ASIC, we wrote to APRA and, and, and the government as well, I believe, Phil, on this issue. You know, as, as Phil's mentioned, just to be specific about the, role, uh, the actions that were taken, but as an advisor, I, I, I've had um, the same thing happen to some of my clients and I have to say, it's, it's really undermined the trust in, in, in level premiums. I uh, completely understand the frustrations there. Okay, thank you both. Uh, there was a question and some observations around uh, advisors suffering mental health issues um, uh, at home, obviously speaking to uh, medical professionals um, and suffering serious medical issues. What's AFA doing in this space to help? Uh, I'm oh, sorry, Phil. No, you go, Mike. I was just gonna say, uh, we're, we're looking, uh, the AFA, we've had our AFA care um, support um, available to members for a number of years. And if you do feel that you need to, that is something that members can use, um, uh, just, just check that out via the AFA website. Um, in terms of the statistics, we're um, looking to be working with some of our um, partners to get a better understanding of that. A, a recent study has been done, uh, some research has been conducted specifically on advisors by Dr. Adam Fraser, who has spoken at the AFA conferences before. Uh, he's working with AIA and that report is due, I believe in the next few weeks. So we'll be looking to, to work with AIA on that, AI on that uh, get, get, get the information out there, but also um, underpin it with some support from members because we know how important um, members' wellbeing is and, and how difficult the last few years have, have been. So the other thing I'd add to that, Matt, is we, we are certainly very aware uh, that there are a number of our members who have been doing it tough and we encourage them to reach out to AFA Care or to reach out to uh, AFA staff. Um, we also, and we've repeatedly, I think, called out for all advisors to keep an eye out for colleagues. Now, it's, uh, it's important that you keep an eye on someone who's struggling. Having someone to talk to, or at least someone who can grab them and say, "Look, we're going to we're going to do something about this. I want to take you, um, want to take you to talk to someone. Want you to go and talk to your doctor." It's really important that you keep an eye out for colleagues, uh, and and at any sign that you're worried, you've got to ask that question: Are you okay? And you can't just ask it once. You got to ask it more than once. And if there's any indication that there's a problem, then we strongly ask you uh, uh, to intervene and to try and help out. So we can't under, understate the importance of, of this as an issue. We do know um, that, that the government is aware of it and has been brought to their attention. Um, but ultimately, uh, it is going to require everyone looking out colleagues and friends. Thank you, Phil. Uh, we have a question just on the um, on the ASIC fee levy hike. Um, have we had any rationale from ASIC about the, the fee hike? So uh, 
Look, I, I just want to be very careful about uh, us blaming ASIC for this because they've been given more funding to spend on um, enforcement action out of the back end of the Royal Commission. What we have a problem with is that advisors are paying for it. Seemingly, that's the only thing that has changed that has driven what is a very substantial increase in expenditure from 33 million uh, in the previous year to 56 million. Now, why should small business financial advisors be paying for it? The only, the only party that can fix this is the government. That's why we have to advocate for the government. We have to talk to local members. We have to continue to call on them, to call on the treasurer to provide relief. Now, I'll just let you know that we understand the invoices will be available today. Now, we don't have visibility on the time frame that you will have to pay them, um, but we will continue to advocate for them. Uh, and and for, this is licensees will access the invoice and they'll obviously pass that on um, to their advisors. Um, please help by contacting your local member. Thanks, Phil. And just one last question before we hand back over to Mike for our last section. Uh, something to clarify. Um, if you're not able to pass the FASIA exam this year, will there be a chance next year? Look, I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. Uh, at this stage, do not make any assumptions. The government has already given a, a, a long extension of 12 months. Um, you should be operating on the basis if you don't pass it this year, you will no longer be classified as an existing advisor. You will no longer be able to be authorised. And the only way to get back is as a new advisor, which would mean that you would need to pass um, the exam. You would need to be degree qualified and you'd need to do the professional year. Please don't operate on any assumptions that there will be any extension. You know, we'll, be, we'll be talking to the government about this as the year progresses. Uh, uh, one of the things that, that we're, we're quite interested in is whether there's a mechanism whereby those who haven't passed at the end of the year will have uh, or could have a limited period of time to exit the industry without causing the disturbance that would come from an immediate and sudden removal of their authorization on the 1st of January next year. Thank you uh, both. Uh, back over to you, Mike. Thanks, Nat. Uh, and, and thank you, Phil. And, and thanks for all those questions from members. Uh, for those of you who didn't get back to, um, that's something that we'll take on board and look to do that. Um, but we, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to, to finish up by um, um, with, with AFA community issues and giving you an idea of how you can uh, engage with the AFA and, and be involved. The first thing that I wanted to raise were the AFA Foundation grants. Now, it's no, um, it's no shock to anyone that the charity's been doing it tough over the past year or so. Um, and and this, um, this initiative gives AFA members the ability to, to support their local charities, or local gra grassroots charities via the AFA Foundation. So what it requires is you to um, jump online, um, afa.asn.au um, and, and complete an application uh, to nominate. I think the minimum grant is $2,000. Uh, you do need to check that your um, charity is, is, is a, a GGR registered. So I just need to make sure of that because I'll only be supplied, grant will only be supplied to them. Um, next slide, please. I've got to rush through these, but pro bono advice network. So. Um, the AFA has a pro bono advice network that, that we partner with uh, multiple sclerosis. What that enables us to do is to be able to provide financial advice to those that are less fortunate and can't afford to pay for advice. Um, you know, as a profession, I believe it's important that we do support members of society that, that need our help. Um, this is something I have done myself. I helped a, um, a single mum called Trudy in her 40s who had MS. Um, I helped her to, to understand her insurance um superannuation we, we she was able to buy a home you better, better utilize the, the dsp 
Um, and actually, we, we found that, that she had an extra income stream type income protection product in one of her policies as well. So she had a guaranteed income for life. So the, the outcome for her financially was, was great, but also uh, in terms of having that, that financial security and that psychological well-being. Um, so to do this, um, I've got the, the note down here. You need to um, um, jump online, the AFA website again, um, register. And then PFAN, uh, the, the Pro Bono Advice Network staff will um, look to match you um, when, when, when the, the, there is a need to, um, to assist someone locally near you. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier that face-to-face -face events are back, yay. Um, so we've got, um, we've got a few events coming up in March. Uh, WA, Western Australia has one on Wednesday the 24th of March, South Australia the 25th, the next day, and then Queensland. Uh, that's my home state. I'll be there uh, on the 26th of March. So just to, just just events to help the community collaborate, get together, and, and like we said, um, ha have a drink and, and be in touch with fellow advisors. Um, events in New South Wales and Victoria coming soon as well. So keep your eyes on those. Um, save the dates. Uh, last year we had that very successful AFA uh, um, uh, uh, what's it called virtual conference. Uh, this year we're looking to do that on the 8th and 9th of September. So can I? You guys all put that in your Outlook diaries. Uh, we'll be looking to uh, do a virtual uh, hybrid event this year and have local um, networking events in each state that coincide with the, the virtual live conference. So that's something we, we, we've changed to, I guess, to cater for the growing demand for the face-to-face. The, um, -face. Um, we've also got some uh, other events which we'll, um, we'll notify you of. Um, webinar series, next slide. Uh, last year, we adapted very quickly to get... The, the, the CPD, the webinars, the engagement um, uh, changed given the COVID environment and we weren't able to be face to face. These were very successful. So we're gonna continue those into uh, 2021, all webinars of CPD, which is great, live and on demand. So uh, next, this year is gonna be bigger and better. Um, uh, and we'll notify you those uh, by email. Um, I just wanted to, to finish off by thanking all of the local um, grassroots contributors uh, at the AFA committees uh, in each state. Um, I want to thank everyone that's chosen to, to, to step up and help and, and serve the AFA and its membership. You know that we, well, I've said this before, we value grassroots and community um, and, and these, these members, uh, you know, uh, to typify what that is. So thank you from, from all of us uh, here at the AFA. Um, finally, if you do want to get involved, um, jump online. Uh, we've got the, the AFA Communities, Gen X Inspire, Practitioner Foundation, and the Paraplanning Community Pulse. We've got local communities uh, in each state. So if you want to get involved, um, please jump online or contact the AFA and see how you can do that. We're always looking for, uh, for more advisors to get involved and contribute. And I'll tell you one thing, um, you, you do get back what you give. Um, it's, uh, you get great friends and connections uh, via these communities. So look, I know that we're a little bit over time, so I wanted to... Uh, Thank you for, uh, for attending. Apologies we couldn't get through all the questions, but we'll look to, look to get back to those people on those. Look, have a great day and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks very much. Thanks.